welcome back to the Cube here at the NYSC studios, our new East Coast location. We've got two sets. One's operational up on the balcony, looking over the show floor. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Dave Vellante is going to pop in. We should be up and running in early 2025, full time, but we're popping in for Media Week here, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Our next guest is Tom Pettit, CEO and co-founder of Ditero AI. Great to see you. We were just chatting before we came on, talking to the, the production team on the 12th floor, getting ready. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, so you guys are, are a great example of a startup that's hitting the scene in the perfect time. We're in, in a super cycle. I love the term super cycle. Uh, Dave Vellante and I both love it. We've seen this before, 86 to 96, the web from uh, 97 to uh, 07, and then now we're in the Gen AI. We saw the cloud wave, so great time. Uh, you guys are in New York. What do you guys do? Give a quick overview about the company and then we'll jump into some uh, AI. Yeah, happy to. And you're right. This is such a great time to be building an AI company. We're a venture-backed company here based in New York. Uh, we're about 20 people and we're building AI for the supply chain, helping procurement teams cut through the noise, focus on what matters by automating, being an assistant to a lot of the routine, boring work that they have to do. Yeah, enterprise AI is hot. I just came back from and just wrote a couple stories on it this week, both on SiliconANGLE and the Cube Research. Only about 1% of the enterprise is actually using AI right now. Mostly it's a big consumer thing with obviously the open AI perplexities of the world and a lot of kind of the big GPU movement on the infrastructure side. But the huge upside in the enterprise is going to be a massive, I think very fast movement in AI. Um, before we get into it, because I, I want to talk about this, the workflows that are out there and the opportunities to understand these processes and how to make AI kind of automated um, as they delegate that responsibility to software. Mm -hmm. yeah. But give a quick stats on when you guys were founded, what's the company makeup look like, what's the culture like, how big are you, what round are you in? Give some of the numbers. Yeah, the quick stats were, we were founded last year, we're about a year old. Uh, we are seed funded. We, you know, we rode the, the wave of AI uh, software for B2B for, for enterprises and mid-market businesses to raise a very good seed round, $7 million, some of the largest venture firms uh, in the Valley. Uh, 20 people, mostly engineers. We've hired people from the best uh, AI companies, uh, Facebook, from uh, Citadel, from you name it, Microsoft, <laughs> AWS, uh, and we've brought them in to work on something that uh, few people pay attention yeah. to, which is you know, the real economy. It's the $30 trillion yeah. of goods that are trading yeah. hands, that are changing hands every single yeah. year. That's what we're focusing on. Yeah, you guys got some good VCs, first round capital, Sarah Gao's in there too, a bunch of other uh, luminaries, uh, and a modest round too, which is great to see that discipline. You take too much cash, you know, you get, <laughs> You get too drunk on cash and you miss the, miss the window. Um, but this is going to be a great way because of the enterprise, I think the enterprise AI is a lot harder than people say it is because the low hanging fruit, the difference between a bubble bursting like the dot com bubble and the AI bubble is that there's real money to be made in services with AI in the enterprise. You guys talk, targeting procurement kind of as, a, as initial beachhead. Uh, I'm sure you're going to go beyond that, but there's a lot of manual labor um, and labor involved in enterprise where workflows can be laid out end to end and AI can be applied to that if it's trusted and delegated properly is a huge opportunity. And just procurement is a, is a low hanging fruit. I'm sure you got other vision. Take us through how you guys are approaching this with your customers as a startup. You probably got some good design partners. Yeah. Take us through some of the, the mechanics of how you guys are engaging your customers. Yeah, what you're saying is exactly right. We, we have statistics that show that supply chain managers, supply chain teams spend roughly 80% of their time doing routine manual workflows, not the strategic stuff that they should be spending their time on. What happens if there's tariffs with China next year? What happens if a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal? You know, all those disruptions that we saw over the last few years have brought to the fore yeah. the importance of having a supply chain uh, that's resilient. And instead of focusing on that resilience, people are stuck handling purchase orders. 50% of people's time is going back and forth managing purchase orders. So what we do is we enable people to take a step back, put some of that honestly quite boring stuff yeah. on the automation uh, so that they can focus on the strategy. And 
you were talking about enterprise. What I find interesting is, you know, some enterprises have very good systems in place. It's very old technology. It's technology from mm -hmm. the 70s, the 80s. But they have some systems to automate the sending out of a purchase order. Some of the real opportunity that we're seeing with our early customers is the mid-market. It's companies that have between 30 and 300 suppliers, um, companies that may have a supply chain team of 5 to 20 people and who don't have access to those enterprise-grade solutions because they're too expensive to set up, they need heavy customization. The step change that AI is enabling is taking those enterprise solutions and making them accessible mm -hmm. to the mid-market because you can skip the very long integration process and the very long customization process mm -hmm. that's so expensive and that is inaccessible for mid-market companies. Um, take me through this, how you guys are thinking about um, this super cycle around this area because one of the things we've been talking about on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE is how in this new era, the ecosystem of partners is important in the enterprise because they mm -hmm. partner with a lot of people. Um, and connected and together is an important aspect, partnering and integration. Um, do you guys see yourselves as more partner friendly in an open ecosystem? Or do you see yourselves being kind of just a game changer brute force in there and just be like that Airbnb, like we're the different new generation yeah. and go run the table? What, what's your we're, we're, view on this? We're very much the former. We're very <laughs> much a partner to yeah. the other companies, the other systems that people have in place. A lot of the companies that we work with have very established ERP systems. They use NetSuite, they use SAP, they have very established accounting processes. We're not coming in and saying, hey, we've got this completely different way of doing things. We're telling them, you know how to run a supply chain. That's your competitive advantage. Let us come in and automate the processes that you've set up over the last 10, 20 years. We can sit on top of some of those other systems that you're using. We can leverage your existing NetSuite systems, but instead of having people whose job it is to spend five hours a day in NetSuite clicking buttons, let us automatically create those purchase orders. Let us check your emails to see if there's a yeah. tracking number that comes in and a shipping date yeah. and import that into your systems. Let us communicate with your suppliers to check that everything is going according to expectations and alert you only if things are going wrong, only if there's an exception. So we're thinking of ourselves not as this full disruptor that yeah, yeah. rips everything out yeah. and puts yeah, yeah. a new system in. Well, We're sitting on top of what yeah. people are using. That's the go big or go home, win or lose, but you're taking more pragmatic, the enterprise is hard. It's very pragmatic. I like that approach. Um, the next question, so I would say that, so, so if, am I correct to say that your strategy as a company is to own the supply chain area, get in there, be experts, be passionate about supply chain, and your entry strategy is procurement, is that, how would you describe that? Is that accurate? That's right, procurement for the, manufacturers and mid-market companies that we serve uh, is a core aspect of their supply chain. And so what we focus on is the tasks that are the most manual, the most routine, for which there are the fewer tools. A lot of what we've yeah. seen is it's in the sourcing, it's in the supplier onboarding, it's in purchase order management, invoice management, compliance, yeah. supplier performance management, all of those aspects of the work. Uh, that often require a lot of manual communications, a lot of uh, repetitive tasks, which can be automated. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the steady state question. So, Tell okay, me. imagine you guys are continuing successfully, you get the next round of funding, you're adding all these uh, awesome talent. In the steady state of you deployed in a customer, what does that look like in your mind's eye? Okay, I can see the customer executing flawlessly with us. What's that steady state business outcome look like with you guys? What's interesting is our long-term vision and how we get there. So the long-term vision is what we call the autonomous supply chain. Imagine a self-driving car. You tell the car where you want to go, it just takes you there. And our vision is a manufacturing business needs 10,000 widgets. They describe the widgets into our software and we can do everything from sourcing to onboarding the suppliers with the right qualifications to managing the purchase orders and the payments to make sure we have the goods. Now, if you're driving a car from the 70s, you're not going to go straight into the futuristic yeah, exactly. self-driving we'll car. We'll just say Tesla. I had an old Mustang, 1965 right. Mustang. Now I got a, a Tesla, completely different animals. They're complete, and you, yeah. you want a bit of a transition. You want to start with a car that may have cruise control and then a car yeah. that may have lane assist. So you're in the data business. We're in the data you're business. You're in the back end 
operational sourcing, full operating environment around serving that business process? Right now we're in the data business ingesting yeah. all the unstructured data yeah. that is sitting within our customers' um, yeah. platforms. A lot of it is completely unusable because it's unstructured. We're taking in that data. Yeah. Right now we're mostly suggesting tools, yeah. suggesting tasks. We're saying, hey, you should be paying attention to this. This is the cruise control, right? We're yeah. telling them, hey, let us help you with a few things, but you stay in control. And progressively, yeah our customers will learn to trust us, to trust the AI, to make more and more of those routine decisions All right, Tom, on their behalf. Take, take me through your recommendation. I'm, I'm a believer, I love the idea of agents. Uh, first I'll use assistants and co-pilots, whatever right. you want to call it, then I'll go to full agentic exactly. reasoning, reinforced learning, et cetera, et cetera. Where do I go from here? I've got this antiquated, outdated infrastructure. I got processes that we well know, I don't want to break anything. What's your recommendation? How would you, recommend that I implement the direction and ultimately get to an agentic environment? What do I got to do? Our customers, our successful customers, are very clear-sighted about what's holding back their teams from being more strategic. What are the workflows that people yeah. do every day that just keep them in the weeds? And so first, you have to understand what people are doing to understand what can be automated, what can be assisted. When we've got a view of that, then we can come in and we can fully understand those workflows. Sometimes we see videos of what those people are doing, which buttons they're clicking on. We can automate them yeah. and we can free up a bunch of time for teams to do what matters. Often yeah. this takes the form of looking at how they use their existing ERPs, how they use NetSuite, how they interact with customers. We look at threads with 50 emails of back and forth for a single supplier onboarding. And that's one supplier, but people have to do that hundreds yeah. of times. We take those, we train AI agents on that specific data, it can be customer specific, and then we can start automating and assisting so much of, uh, of those workflows. It's great to have the co-founder, CEO on because you get asked the, the questions around culture. <laughs> every company has a cadence. Intel used to be Moore's Law, fast or doubling every whatever right. months. What is the um, culture like? You guys wake up every day, you just like eat process for breakfast. What's your, how would you describe the DNA of the founders and the company? You guys just love process, love automation. What was, what's the cadence of the right. mindset of the, the, um, the A team? Well, the first thing is we're very technical. Yeah. Uh, I, I lead the business. I'm yeah. also the tech co-founder and I come from a data science AI background. Yeah. I work for companies like HelloFresh, like Airbnb. I had a yeah. previous startup before this. And so I live in the code, in the data. We pay very close attention to that. And we bring on people who are just as yeah. passionate about that. But then we inculcate, we share that passion that we have for the supply chain. And the supply chain is a bit yeah. like the internet. Yeah. As long as it's working, everyone just assumes that it's fine. People yeah, yeah. don't understand what's below the surface. When things break, as we've seen recently, yeah. people understand the importance. Yeah. So we share some of that passion for the supply chain with the people that bring on. And that's a very unique yeah. combination in the tech world. People are spending a ton of hours on app tech, on consumer tech. There's very few teams yeah. that are as passionate about yeah. working on the supply chain. So that's the core of what we are. And then we have very quick iteration cycles on the technology. Every week we ship new features. Yeah. Uh, we use the latest yeah. and greatest from all the open source and closed source AI models. And we can really make a difference pretty quickly in, in what we build for our yeah. customers. And the code, I mean, everything is code and services now, microservices and cut services. Um, and that's helpful. A lot of people don't understand oper operations is technical too. I mean, you talk about whether it's running a big monster hyperscaler yeah. data center or cloud, yeah. IT or whatever operations. Yeah. Operations is workflows, it's, it's code. Workflows. It's workflows and yet yeah. those teams that matter so much yeah. have been ignored by mainstream technology. If you go to Silicon Valley, there's very few founders yeah. who are focused on helping those teams that day in and day out get yeah. us the goods that we need or get the goods that manufacturing teams need to yeah. get their revenue to manufacture their own products. So you know, so bringing more attention to this space is really, really fun. You know, we've been saying it for years in our last podcast last Friday, uh, folks, if you want to hear it, um, it was about IBM and others in the enterprise. We've been saying for years that software economics applied to services, professional services, changes the game. The old way to transform and do a transformation in procurement was 
You call the big consultants to right. come in. It's going to be a 10-week project. We're going to bill right. you tons of cash. Ten weeks we'll have another 10-month action plan. And exactly. after 10 months, we'll maybe have a recommendation. I mean, I'm over, I'm over the top. But the point was, it was very long drawn out. Give me your watch. I'll tell you what time it is. Exactly. Consultants. Professional service. I mean, I'm being a little bit hyperbole there. But the point is, professional services used to be, oh, my God, if it's not a platform that scales exponentially, I don't want to invest in professional services, or, or professional services is not a good area to invest. What you guys are doing is what we're seeing as the AI trend, where service yeah. is, could be web services, cloud services, app services, AI services, and the professionals getting blended into the platforms where there's operating leverage that have software economics. That's right. That's right. I guess, Do you see that? Do you really don't really care about whether you're called professional services because you're basically providing a professional service with software? We're, so it's, not, but it's uh, not like a SaaS app where it's like, hey, I download the app and I'm right. like, you know, whatever, yeah. self-serving. Your platform is part of the delivery of the service. That's exactly right. So there's there's two extremes to the spectrum. There's the SaaS software platforms, old-fashioned. They just tell you you know, take it, you use it, you configure it, you're on your own. Yeah. And then there's the full-blown professional services where you don't even have access to a platform. We see a great middle ground where we give access yeah. to a platform, but we provide the underlying services that yeah. make the process of using the platform completely seamless. A lot of what happens yeah. on the platform would formerly have had to be run by the customers, yeah. and we can do it on that on their behalf. And the I've agents got, become the service and the delivery. Agents become, exactly, that's right. I've got two co-founders. <laughs> They're both incredible. One is yeah. from a consulting background from McKinsey, and so he saw those yeah. long implementations, and he saw yeah. what could be made better. Another comes from a manufacturing background, and he was looking for software that could help yeah. him run his company. Yeah. He didn't find anything that didn't have those half a million dollar budgets and six yeah. month implementation periods. So we're really building what he would have wanted to have when he was running. So your competitive strategy, business. if I could maybe guess and connect the dots, is to be agile on the delivery of the value faster than anyone else. That's exactly right. We've onboarded customers in 24 hours. And that's something that yeah. just was not possible before Gen AI came along. Well, Tom, great to have you here on theCUBE. Great conversation. We're in New York. We're going to be here with a team. So we'll probably see you at some of our events and meetups. We're going to have probably kind of a, do a cool social meetup situation here. I love New York. I love the action. Um, it it's reminds me. To be. Yeah, it's a great place to be. And of course, we'll connect it through content. We'll certainly have you back on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for and having congratulations. me, Congratulations. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. The Cube is here inside the New York Stock Exchange for our kicking off of another media week talking to the AI leaders. Startups, speed and agility to deliver the value. Software economics in the model is what's key. AI is just another application. And so we're going to see a lot of sea change, a lot of transformation, new brands emerging. You're going to get it all here in the Cube. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.